afternoon, everybody. I'm Julia Boyd, Executive Director for the Atlanta Press Club, and thank you for joining us today. Pardon our tardiness. We had a little audio issue logging in, uh, but we're so pleased that you're here for our virtual Gold Dome recap, where our panelists will unpack the 2024 legislative session. A big thank you to our friends at the Georgia First Amendment Foundation who partner with us to bring you this program, as well as our Gold Dome kickoff program every January. For more information about the amazing work that GFAF does, please visit gfaf.org and be sure to check out their legislative watch page, which we'll put in the chat. For more information about the Atlanta Press Club, including membership options, upcoming events, uh, please visit atlantapressclub.org. Two events that are coming up in the next few weeks are our Loudermilk Young debate series on April 28th and also our Awards of Excellence event on Tuesday, April 30th. And again, you can find more information about those programs online. Now on to today's program, uh, please feel free to utilize that chat box as we'll be talking about a lot of different issues throughout. So we'll take those uh, questions as they come in. Um, and I would just like to welcome and thank all of our panelists. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, first up Nora Benavidez, Legislative Committee Co-Chair for the Georgia First Amendment Foundation and Senior Counsel at Free Press. Jonathan O'Brien, news anchor reporter at WSB Radio, and Maya Prabhu, government reporter at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Our moderator for today will be Raul Bali, politics reporter at WABE and current Atlanta Press Club board member. Take it away, Raul. Good afternoon, everybody. And again, sorry for uh, our bit of our tardiness. Um, we're here to talk about the 24 session and not just the 40 days we were in session, but you know what's happened since and what's still uh, coming up. And we're going to talk about a range of legislations, including issues around open government that the bills everyone wanted to talk to us about. Um, let me start off with kind of an easy question. Um, you know, sometimes the biggest bills aren't the ones that people always ask about. So I'm going to start with my friend in the state Senate. And for those of you who have never been to the Capitol or come to the Capitol, uh, over in the state Senate, we have a, a press box in the very back, and and the person who sits all the way in one corner is Maya Prabhu, and sometimes sitting next to her is me. So, Maya, we're going to start with you. And, Maya, what was the bill or piece of legislation, whether it was lawmakers, whether it was um, uh, uh, your readers, people on social media, just your friends, what was the bi bill people talked to you most about? So it's not a bill, but other than best dressed um, legislators, uh, I would say I was asked most often, it was probably a tie between um, bills around sports betting and bills around um, that, that bills that affect transgender youth. So those were the two ones that came up the most for me, just because I'm more of a social issues kind of reporter. So that, that's the stuff I typically cover. And I would absolutely agree. One of the top two bills that that people asked me about was was anything around gambling and the expansion of gambling. That's a question I would I would regularly get. Uh, let's go to the other side of the state capitol. And, and a person who regularly sits in the House uh, box is Jonathan O'Brien from WSB. Jonathan, um, what was for you the, the kind of the bill, whether it was your managers, your talk show host? Uh, what what did you get the most calls about? Well, anything to do with elections, I think, was something that folks were really interested in, um, you know, and we saw several of those. And really, it always, I got asked about it by Mark Aram and several other talk show hosts, sports betting. Sports betting was the thing, the issue that we all know never dies, and uh, one that was, it did die this year. Um, but uh, that was definitely one that I was frequently asked about. You know, Nora, you're I just as important as the people who are down at the Capitol every day, like Maya, Jonathan, and I. The people who 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 are watching the Capitol like a hawk, like you, you're down there from time to time. But what what was like? What was getting your attention? Whether it was open government or not, what were the things you were watching for? What was the number one thing for you? Thanks, Raul. I have to say, no one asked me about sports betting. So now I feel FOMO because uh, not, not a one time, none of the interviews, none of the conversations when I would go to the Capitol. 
you know, it's great to be here. Of course, I got asked so many questions about First Amendment related bills, but that's a pretty wide gamut. And over the course of the session, we saw over 40 bills that would somehow relate to free expression or open government, access to records. So if I had to pick just one of those issues, the number one that people asked me about were the social media and technology bills, um, whether it was the deep fake bill that would make it a felony to use deep fake um, or kids access to social media. Those really seem to be the hot issues that over and over, you know, as Georgians are testing these out, I got questions. You know, Nora, let, I want to start there, you know, as, as somebody who's a, a father of a 13-year-old and a nine-year-old who, who their favorite channel is YouTube, um, they're not in some of the other social media. Let's talk about Senate Bill 351, which was was one of the bills that you were following. Uh, that was, I, I'd love to hear you because you were following that day in and day out. I'd follow it some days and not other days. What was in the final legislation on Senate Bill 351? Sure. Well, 351 would allow schools and social media companies to make decisions about kids' use of social media. Um, it was, from the beginning, I felt a fast-tracked bill and one that we watched diligently. Um, the Georgia First Amendment Foundation opposed that bill. We continue to oppose it. We hope that uh, now that it has passed through both chambers, that the governor will explicitly veto that bill. Let me talk a little bit about age verification and sort of the limits or access that kids have, because that's really what we're talking about here. Um, and limits for children to any kind of content, I would say, is an imperfect solution when it comes to making sure that people see appropriate content. Um, and much of that is because it creates a number of questions. Uh, placing access for kids in the hands of parents, tech companies, online services, one, implicates the issues within a family. Sometimes kids are trying to access things that their parents don't want them to because they may think that they are gay or trans and they wanna research that. If a parent is unsupportive, it could be incredibly painful and detrimental if a parent learns about that. There are also just data issues. You know, um, All of the data collected about kids, these companies have themselves. And so when given the opportunity as social media companies to close off access, I do not believe that that will ever be a perfect, um, clean solution to protecting kids from harmful content. Ultimately, that really has to be something that we deal with in much more sophisticated and nuanced ways. So this is a bill that has had a, a lot of fervor around the Capitol. Um, it also touches on some of the other kids-related bills that we've heard about, like the book banning, librarian types of bills, which would um, expose librarians to criminal charges if kids are seen to have access to harmful content. And that's where we get into just, uh, it opens up a can of worms in wondering why our Capitol has been so insistent on kids this year. So what are you going to be watching for in terms of input? I mean, let's just assume the governor does sign. What are you going to be watching for when it becomes when it comes to implementation? Who implements or who's going to enforce this and what are you going to be watching for? That's a great question. I mean, you know, for those that are less familiar with the legislative process, I often feel that this session is just the first moment for us. Um, in our watchdog role. And I, by myself, don't do all of this. Um, Georgia First Amendment Foundation does not do all of this, but together there is a safety net that I feel um, helps protect and gird against First Amendment and free expression violations. Um, from the beginning of the legislative session, there is an opportunity to speak closely with members about ailments to bills, when that doesn't work and bills move forward, there are more public ways that we advocate. And I think we've seen so many people advocate at the Capitol when they go testify or they fill out petitions, um, when organizations you know, lobby themselves for their constituents. But frankly, at the end of the day, there is a political movement here. There is sort of a wave that we are seeing um, of anti-democratic legislation moving. Um, the, 
very explicitly targets our free expression and access to records uh, ability. And so I think it then turns to litigation and I don't do that alone, um, but I think it's important to understand the wraparound experience of where the session sits. And this is just one piece of what will become a much longer set of watchdog uh, activities. So we'll be looking at how social media companies and schools are limiting children's access to social media. Um, I know many colleague organizations are working on this as well and are thinking about how do we stay in touch with parents and schools, teachers that may feel that there is an inappropriate limit on access. I'm Raul Valley. You're hearing uh, the voice of, uh, of Norbin Villas. I, and just to let everybody know who's joined us, first of all, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have a Q&A and a chat, and if you want to start dropping questions in there, we'll either do them at the end or or just try to drop them in uh, here and there. Maya, I want to talk, uh, I want to jump off something that that Nora talked about is, is and, and something you mentioned, that the social issues. A lot of those social issues and social bills started in the Senate. Um, and, and so let's start off, for, for example, uh, some of the stories we did around transgender youth. And I didn't do a lot of those. My colleague, Sam Gringlass at WABE did, but you did a lot of those too. Talk about what actually did get through the legislature this year. As far as the social issues, um, very little. A lot got through the Senate. Um, where, like you said, these um, ideas originated, a lot of them backed by the lieutenant governor who, you know, it's an open secret that he will most likely be running for governor um, in two years. So um, a lot of it was that, a lot of it was other senators who had primary opponents introducing legislation that maybe they never actually wanted to pass um, that got pushed through the Senate. But as far as social issues, um, a lot of them made it out of the Senate and then just kind of languished in the House, which is often what happens with some of these, especially more uh, more conservative, far right, con considered far right type of uh, red meat issues for Republicans. Uh, oftentimes they'll make it out of the Senate and then they'll go and languish in the House. Let me slide over to Jonathan. Jonathan, you mentioned elections. Um, what, what elections, be, there were so many, it was hard to, it, there was a time we were, uh, uh, you know, it'd be this election bill, then somebody was, Hey, go look at that bill. And, um, we, we've, we've had to do this for the past couple of years, chasing where legislation is and where it's based out of what were kind of the key legislative things that got done around elections this year. Right. Well, in my opinion, you know, we saw bills from like Representative LaHood, which dealt directly with, um, you know, with the administration of elections and things like that. He wanted more audits and, and, and all of that. And then on the flip side of that, you had um, Representative Carson uh, and his bill dealing with, uh, you know, deep fakes in elections, which was something that kind of came to the front of the headlines around the time the bill was proposed because we saw that in New Hampshire. And I see Nora nodding her head because it was actually something she mentioned that reminded me of how important that bill was because what we saw in New Hampshire was uh, a deep fake phone call of the president uh, saying that no one needed to go vote. And, and I think it was a worrying sign for election officials around the country. Uh, Representative Thomas uh, said that he wanted to um, you know, address that in his bill and uh, that bill, um, you know, dealing with deep fakes in elections and, and AI, um, you know, it, it was one that, uh, that I watched closely. Um, actually seeing uh, one of our first questions come through from Tim Baker uh, around, you know, school voucher, school choice legislation, um, you know, that was one of the bills that actually is one of the big bills that did get done this year. Um, you know, it, it's had close votes in, in the House before, but it made it through the House this year. Um, who wants to jump in on, on kind of covering the basics? Um, you know, you know, uh, it includes, you know, for if your child is in the bottom 25 percent of schools, uh, then you would be given a six thousand five hundred dollar um, grant per year per child 
to either homeschool or put into a private school. It's going to be interesting to see how this even gets implemented. What were you hearing? Let's start let's start with Maya. What were you hearing about getting this legislation done? Um, a lot of, uh, well, I think there was a turning point when the House Speaker went to the committee uh, to testify and speak in support of uh, the voucher legislation. Um, that was kind of a turning point for the House because we've seen, I mean, in both chambers in recent years, it's failed like very closely. But this time, you know, with the speaker's blessing, essentially, uh, that kind of turned around some of the House members, House Republican members who may have voted against it last year. Um, and so the thing that that I often hear is that, you know, sixty five hundred dollars is not a lot of money. It's not going to cover the cost of private schooling, um, which I think uh, I don't have children, so I can't speak to that. But I, I think that. Um, I mean, I think that's a valid argument. Um, and like you said, it would be interested to, interesting to see how it's implemented and how many people actually take advantage of it. Jonathan, uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Well, I thought it was very significant when it passed. You know, it was it's something we've heard so much about. And I think Misha Maynard, of course, it, we were all there for the debate, you know, in the House. And she got up there and she, um, you know, she's the you know former Democratic representative who flipped to, uh, to to being a Republican mainly because of this issue, um, and and her desire to see some sort of school choice or school voucher bill uh, passed. Uh, we saw a lot of the same arguments, but like Maya said, it was really once Speaker Burns put his full weight behind it. You had him lining up behind Speaker Pro Tem Jan Jones, and I think that was really the momentum that that this bill needed. And of course, the governor. Uh, mentioned it in his state of the state, as I recall, uh, that he wanted to see something like this. Uh, you know, Raul, you've covered more general assembly sessions than I have, and I correct me if I'm wrong. This is something that's come up, you know, multiple times. What Maya said about the concern about the cost of private school, I did hear that a lot. I heard that from once it went over to the Senate. Elena Parent um, made a point of that. She said, "Look, if we really want to help, uh, let's give them twenty-five thousand dollars." You know that. And if you look at a private school tuition in Metro Atlanta, you're going to pay more than $6,500 or $6,000. Um, but Senator Greg Dolezal countered that with, then the parents have a little bit of skin in the game. So I thought it was very significant. Like you say, what will be interesting, I believe it's 2026 or 20, you know, there's some time if the governor signs it, um, which we expect that he will um, before it's uh, implemented. And it will be very interesting to see what that's like. Hey, Nora, I want to bring you into this conversation in terms of what is going to be the data that we as reporters are going to need access to. What what may be data that, that we don't have access to or do have access to? When it comes to school systems, I feel like we have relatively good. I've never been a day in a dad education reporter. Education's been part of you know my beat, but not on a day in and day out basis. What is going to be the kind of the open government, sunshine, data points, beyond just the money, where the money's coming from, what what schools the kids are coming from that are getting, the, what 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 are the things that, that you think reporters and the general public should be looking for when it comes to that kind of data? Hmm. Well, I mean, that's a great question. I, you know, the Georgia First Amendment Foundation did not work explicitly on the school vouchers bill. What was interesting, though, I will say is that I refer to this as a zombie bill. Um, it did not work at more, nor move last year, but it then came back this year, of course. And so we often see that legislation that either for political reasons or otherwise, you know, due to lobbying, they languish and then they come back again. Um, for reporters, uh, and this is really a question I'm hearing throughout all of your questions, you know, how do we cover these issues? How do lawyers have the right types of stories to bring cases that challenge unconstitutional legislation? How do reporters have access to data that properly contextualize for readers what's at stake? 
Those are great questions. Um, and so much right now is unclear. Um, what, what I do know is that the funds for the voucher program would not come out of the quality basic education. Um, and so I have questions myself and I know others do about where this would be coming from, um, what kinds of monitoring you should be doing. And I think it begins by telling that story, by explaining what's at stake for families, for parents, for taxpayers. I see already in the Q&A that there are questions about, you know, where is this money coming from? Is this taxpayer money? And starting uh, as reporters from explaining the implications of this bill, I think is the most important step. And from there, trying to understand, are there private schools and are there families that are leveraging this? That's really the next question in my mind. Uh, Maya and Jonathan, if you guys wanna chime in, uh, again, a question from uh, the same person, it is Tim Baker. Uh, where does the money come from? Where does it going? And what does it do to property tax and funding for public schools? That's a lot to go with. Let's just start off. What our understanding is where the money is coming from to fund the 6,500. I'm going to I'm going to let Jonathan handle that, because uh, like Rose said, I do not I cover the ins and outs the over here. <laughs> And you can't pass the buck over here. No, I, um, you know, my understanding, it's like Nora said, you know, there's a lot that we, that we, you know, just, just, uh, you know, just don't know. I know that there are a lot of limits on who exactly can, you know, it has to do with your income. It has to do with the, the school that your child is in. Um, so there are a lot of factors um, that, you know, are, are involved, you know, the property taxes and, and funding public schools, that is something I heard a lot of people say, you know, we're going to be paying these taxes. People are worried basically that it will defund public schools. Um, and I don't, you know, that, that argument, going back to what Nora said, that it's not going to take money out of the, you know, QBE, it's not going to limit education funding. I want to, a, a personal, you know, connection I have to this is, uh, you know, uh, I have a family member who needed to, a few years ago, the state implemented, uh, I don't know the name of the scholarship, but basically if you're in a public school and you can't get the education you need because you have a learning disability, then you can get a smaller voucher than this, you know, 6,500 that's on offer uh, here. Um, and then you can take that to put towards a, you know, a private school uh, education. Um, my grandma often referred to that as the state of Georgia failure check uh, as, as an acknowledgement of that. So, but that doesn't take away from the, the funding for the school. So I, I imagine it's going to be something like that. I wish, Tim, that I had a better answer for you. So I'm just going to do, and again, we, we had an education reporter um, who covered most of this for WABE. But from my understanding is, is, is this will be a, a line item for the budget. Um, and when it comes to the QBE formula, uh, it will not immediately affect uh, the school formulas. Uh, it will down the line. That was my understanding uh, with the legislation. Definitely something that all of us are going to be, you know, like I said, we had an education reporter who was covering uh, this in, you know, day in and day out. Um, but in terms of it, it's going to be interesting and important to watch what um, it's, it's going to be important to see what happens with the funding with the public schools. Um, but yes, the, the 6,500 is going to have to be uh, funded, appropriated uh, through the budget process. And then we see what happens with the QBE formula going down the road. Uh, I wanted to switch, to, uh, switch topics. Uh, we mentioned gambling just for a second. You know, Jonathan, you mentioned that, you know, we've been doing vouchers for quite a few years. We've been doing gambling for quite a few years, too. And and once again, got through the, uh, well, it had already gotten through the, well, it had to go through the Senate again, uh, and then basically stalled out in the House. Uh, Maya, the legislation started in the Senate with state senators, uh, Clint Dixon and, and Bill Kausert. A little bit of a different approach this year, which involved a constitutional amendment. Just kind of walk our audience through that. So this is the topic that will not go away. I've been writing about this one for, I think this is, I've covered seven sessions and I've 
think I've been writing about it for six. <clears throat> and so there are two camps of people who support uh, expanding gambling. There are the people who think that you can add sports betting underneath the lottery and therefore it does not require a constitutional amendment. Then there are people who say you must amend the state constitution in order to allow sports betting in the state. And so we've seen them try a variety of ways to get a bill over to the house because it almost always originates in the Senate to get a bill over to the House that the House members can agree on. Um, the issue with amending the state constitution is it takes two thirds of the chamber to support it, which means each chamber will need democratic support, especially since there are Republicans who will never vote for any bill that expands gambling. And so this year's approach was, it started out, um, this is like super like, inside baseball, but like stuff that makes us giggle as reporters. Um, you know, it started out as a bill that would just go and be signed by the governor, the lottery, I mean, the sports betting would be under the lottery. And then, you know, in the process, it got amended to require a constitutional amendment, and then got sent over to the House. And then we saw um, Bill Kausert come in and pass a constitutional or propose and pass out of the Senate a constitutional amendment that didn't quite align with the um, with the we call enabling legislation that was the initial bill. Um, got to House committee, they made tons of changes and they got it out of committee as they almost always do. And then, you know, then it then that's it. <laughs> that's all she wrote, which is kind of the process every year for these uh uh, sports betting bills. Jonathan? I think I think exactly what Maya said. You know, I, I have covered the legislature from afar and, you know, just, just a little bit over the past few years, and I know that this issue is one that continuously comes up. I remember it was Maya and you and I, Raul, where we were all outside of the Senate chamber talking to uh, Bill Kalsard after he you know, got that amendment passed to put that constitutional amendment on there. And you asked, is this going to kill this bill? And, you know, I'd be interested to see y'all's analysis, but I feel like we can all agree it did. Made it a higher hurdle for uh, lawmakers to clear. Because I think the key thing, you know, to add on to what Maya said, yes, when you add a constitutional amendment and you go to that two thirds bar, that really brings Democrats into play. I mean, you probably needed Democratic votes, but when you have to get a two-thirds majority in the House and Senate, then you absolutely lean Democratic votes. And in a power structure, in a state where Democrats don't have a ton of legislative power, this is one of the areas where they can ask for something. Um, and we heard all sorts of things of, of whether it's uh, prioritizing money for, for pre-K, that comes out of hope right now, you know, it's split up between the hope scholarship and pre-K. This would be a prioritization uh, of pre-K. We heard about the possibility of, of a department of urban affairs that was mentioned by uh, outgoing house minority leader, James Beverly. We heard all sorts. Of, so that was the other dynamic that, that came into play with gambling. But Jonathan's right. We've been, and Maya too, we've been dealing with these two things for, for quite a few years. Um, Nora, I want to bring you in this conversation because you mentioned zombie bills. Um, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, we had a gambling bill that ended up into the, the, the fl airline, uh, the airline uh, gas tax bill. It was, I think Maya, you remember this too. There was like four bills in one. Um, talk about, that's one of the, you know, we as reporters talk about this challenge of, hey, is this bill now this bill? Is that, what is this actual bill? We're sitting in the, uh, Jonathan and I on, on the final night, and I think Maya too over in the Senate, we'll be sitting there, what is this bill that just came up? And even if we open, and this is where you come in, Nora, even if you open up the website, that may not be the actual bill. There's, uh, there, the title may be one thing and the issue is another. Talk about that challenge for the public. Just real quick. Role. Yeah. It, it's not just us who are saying, what does this bill do? It's also lawmakers on the floor <laughs> trying true. to figure out how <laughs> they would have <laughs> Yeah, we, we, we no, see that a lot. 
we've gotten up there where a lawmaker said, you know, just a little inside baseball, you know, when they introduce a bill, uh, you know, the clerk will read the bill or, or one of the clerk's assistants will read the bill. And literally the first words out of the lawmaker's mouth is, well, you heard what the bill is called, but this is what it's actually about. So, Nora, talk about in the, in the context of open government and, and the challenges we face with legislation being copied and pasted. It doesn't match the name that's signed. And, and is, there, is there a responsibility of, of, of lawmakers or government to make that easier? I love this question. I love it because it's sort of philosophical, you know, and I saw Maya nodding vigorously uh, to just the, the circumstances. Let's, you know, give lawmakers benefit of the doubt for a moment. Things move really fast, just for a moment. Things move really fast. Amendments get added um, at any given moment, small provisions here or there. I've been this past session in a hearing ready to testify as a witness on a bill that we found troubling. Um, And in reading the text, it had changed from when I left my house to when I got to the hearing room. Now, is that happenstance? Was that on purpose? I'm not sure. Um, At best, I think it means that we're often cobbling pieces of legislative text together. And it can be, on the one hand, comical. I mean, you can sort of sit there wondering, will this bill reemerge as an amendment in another active bill? Uh, Is there a version that we don't know? I've seen senators themselves admit I haven't seen the new text. I haven't seen it. I don't know what I'm supposed to be voting on. Um, And so from a slightly more sinister perspective, let's talk about that. What does that really do um, both to lawmakers themselves and to the public, including journalists? I think it can lead to distrust. Um, It leads to an environment in which uh, lawmaking is an opaque process. And it feels from the outside like we're never quite sure where the there there is. Is there an amendment or a provision that we as journalists or the public or those who are advocates haven't seen? Um, It presents uh, numerous problems. And it's a problem that isn't just in Georgia. This is all the way from the local level of lawmaking and how local issues occur through Congress. Um, This is something that we have to reckon with. And I'm so proud. I'm frankly almost intimidated to be here with all three journalists. Uh, I'm never the minority. And it's amazing that part of your role is to help shine a light on those fast moving issues, Uh, because these things change on a dime. Uh, You know, a, a provision that has suddenly been added in that either makes a bill untenable or actually create something that might be leeway to negotiate and gain more public and advocate support on an issue. Um, When it happens under cover of closed door discussion with no public record, it makes it incredibly hard as an advocate to then say that lawmakers are doing their job of listening to constituents. And so we continue to need journalists to play that watchdog role. And we need advocates who are at the Capitol, often slogging long hours, as long as lawmakers, to monitor in real time what happens when bills evolve. So it's an incredibly important issue. And by nature, it it sort of breeds a kind of confusion. And, And taken to, I think, the natural conclusion, it makes people wary of what our lawmakers are really doing during those 40 days. Yeah, I can I can tell you that both Maya and me had quite a few early morning and Jonathan, a lot of early mornings and a lot late nights um, with some really late hearings. We had some hearings that finished in the eight o'clock hour, maybe even nine o'clock hour. Maya, we, we had a few. Um, those and, uh, and those Senate Judiciary meetings, they go <laughs> very late. <laughs> um, uh, Nora, I know you're you, first of all, we appreciate you being here, Nora. Um, I, I wanted to share another bit of insight for our audience because people like Nora are important. You know, Maya, Jonathan, we don't just talk to lawmakers. We do talk to advocates on both sides. We do talk to lobbyists on both sides. And and I, you know, Jonathan, well, let's start, Jonathan, start with you. Yes, we talk to lawmakers all the time, but 
you know, we talk to a lot of people, name the issue. There are a lot of important advocates, you know, we talked, you know, we talked about, you know, school vouchers, school choice. We talked to people on both sides of that one who, who said, look at this, look at that, look at this. Um, Jonathan, talk about the role that, that all of those people play at the Capitol. Absolutely. Well, I can, school vouchers is a prime example. I was interviewing um, Lisa Morgan uh, with the Georgia Association of Educators, and as I got up, uh, a lady stopped me, and she was on the school choice side, and she was with another, um, you know, American Federation of Parents or a, a group like that, and she wanted to talk about it. She wanted me to be sure that I knew about something in the bill, and, you know, we ha we do get pulled aside by these folks in the hallway and given a card and, and told to look at this or look at that. Um, for me, uh, we're, we're nowadays, so stories from the legislature can get procedural. We try, I know we all try to think about ways, okay, how does this affect real people? And so when you can find real people to talk, I'm getting the thumbs up from Nora, I feel good about my, I feel good about it. <laughs> um, you know, if, um, you know, if you can answer that question and if you can get a real person, I think that makes people more interested in your story. And I think we all feel better about the job that we're, that we're doing because that's why we do it. We do it to inform the people about what their government is, is uh, doing in their name. Maya, talk about how important is the people who pull us to the side, you know, the people who come talk to us in the Senate press box or the people who talk to us in the hallway. Uh, how important are those people in, in what we do and how we I mean, endlessly important. I, you know, journalism is very much about making connections with sources and and making sure that you guys have a rapport to where they feel comfortable coming to you and saying, "Hey, make sure you pay attention to this." For for senators or lawmakers specifically, or even lobbyists will say, "Hey, pay attention to this bill," because often they'll know <laughs> before we do and before other lawmakers do about an amendment that's going to be in a bill or a change that's going to happen to a bill. So it's like, and en it's endlessly important to have good connections, good relationships with sources across the board. And whether that's someone who's a paid lobbyist or someone who's a concerned parent who's coming in to talk about, you know, topics that affect their children. And I, I did also want to mention when we were talking about, um, uh, open records and access, you know, the General Assembly has exempted itself from the Open Records Act. So when they're having these emailed discussions about how to change bills, we can't even uh, request to see those emails to see kind of like who was influencing it, where did a language come from? That's something that we're not even able to see at any point unless you know, uh, just because they're exempt doesn't mean it's illegal for them to <laughs> tell us. Oftentimes they will tell us things that um, they could be exempt from, but unless you have those relationships, right, um, you, there's, it's possible that you'll never know how a bill transforms from this to this. Um, you know, we, we use the word open government a lot, Nora, and I, I want to give an example that people in the public know. And that's the, the the questions and issues around booking photos. When someone's arrested mm. and has to take a picture, and there's been a lot of conversation at the Capitol. And and this is one of those things where if I just throw it out to my non-political friends, um, everyone has an opinion about what to do about booking photos. Um, you know, should they be should they be used by the media? Um, they're obviously used by websites. Uh, you know, I'm from Augusta, Georgia, and uh, uh, there was a little newspaper called The Jail Report, and it literally was three or four pages of mugshots. Uh, and, and the front page mugshot, you know, somebody who's looking crazy or somebody who's famous. Um, you know, how booking shots are used. Should booking photos be public, um, you know, before someone's convicted? Should booking photos be be allowed to make money? You know, when when Donald Trump's booking photo, uh, if I remember right, in that first couple of months, he he made about three raised three million dollars from it. If I and he got to do that number at the top of my head, but it was in the millions. Talk about the legislation that we saw on booking photos and the issues that you all raised about it. 
Yeah. This was, you know, the number one question I got, of course, was around social media issues, tech, free expression. But the second most common question I got was about what many called the mugshots bill. Um, and that was HB 882, which would prohibit the release of mugshots until conviction. And it would impose civil penalties for failure of the media to remove those booking photos upon request. Um, and I want to be really candid with you. Um, I think that there are necessarily important things to acknowledge on the privacy side here that many in the criminal justice space said this bill would do wonders you know if my clients are arrested and suffer uh, adverse employment action because of some wrong arrest or because their booking photo was published the next day in a local paper you know that's a real issue um, and and I think it's important to acknowledge that at the same time the Georgia First Amendment Foundation um, really felt that there were other larger, more troubling issues at play with this bill. Um, and I'll name a few of them. Let's first talk about the, the climate that we are in right now when it comes to police misconduct, um, police opacity. You know, there is tremendous attention on issues around the police training facility here outside of Atlanta, what many refer to as the sort of cop city development. Um, but along with that, there have been several years of growing um, confusion and claims of police misconduct in various counties around the state. At this time, to limit the public and journalistic access to know who's been arrested, who has been booked, that creates a kind of what I think is wild west for people in the system. We have no sense of who's there. And it poses safety concerns. It poses open access and, as you say, open government concerns that are far more uh, damaging and concerning than the ad hoc privacy issues that I mentioned at the top. And so it's gotten a lot of attention. Of course, that bill did not pass. Um, and I see that my colleague has put that in the chat, which is good to remind us. Sometimes we can get lost in discussing how big or important a bill was, the oxygen that it took up. Um, we have to remind ourselves, well, that didn't pass. And we did a lot of work with the sponsors and with others on this bill, acknowledging that there are really strong points here, that it's important that people have a private right of action if their mugshot has been used and not removed. And yet police, uh, you know, closing off any access for reporting or for advocates to know who's in the system creates uh, untold consequences that can cascade down community after community. Real quick, I want to ask one other kind of big picture open government, because we had some other bills in this area. When is it appropriate for address personal addresses personal information um or public information to be redacted and not redacted i think because we had a couple of bills some that got through some that didn't you know when should we know somebody's address a judge's address and when should those addresses be pr protected when should we know um mm. if an officer was involved do we know the name of the officer or not name an officer involved in an officer involved shooting? Uh, kind of uh, what is the foundation's kind of approach to these things when you guys talk to lawmakers? I could spend a full hour, Rahul, talking about this. And I'll, I'll, I'll try to limit. I know we're coming up on time and I want to have time for you know audience questions. Um, and this is this is really the heart of where our Georgia First Amendment Foundation work sits. Um, there were uh, almost a dozen bills that related in some way to open government or access to records this legislative session. Um, many of those we supported, and I could rattle off uh, a variety of them, whether it's, for example, just access for teleconference meetings to allow public participation. Um, that's a generally positive and expansive type of bill. There were other limiting bills that would limit access to certain types of records. 
Um, when it comes to addresses, SB 324 passed and it awaits the governor's signature. That would create an address confidentiality program uh, for victims of domestic violence. And the foundation really supported that bill. Uh, but what you're asking is a much bigger sort of how do we assess the um, merits of limits and expansions on access uh, for an address confidentiality program for very specific classes of people. Um, I think part of why we were supportive is that it would help limit the risk of attack, uh, physical or otherwise, for victims of domestic violence. That is a, a tremendous step forward for protections for this class of people. Judges uh, are a very different class of people. And I know that all the way from other states through the way social media companies think about this, you know, should we as the public have access to judges' addresses? That's a, a very different issue from victims of domestic violence. And so as we assess these, we are incredibly careful thinking through what is the public interest and benefit for uh, communities to have this information? Does that outweigh whatever the other types of risks would be of that information being made public? And we make that determination for every bill when we see it, um, trying to carefully balance and weigh what those stakes are. Uh, as we got about 10 minutes left, the Q&A and the chat is open for anybody who'd like to throw in a question for any of the four of us. Um, where Jonathan and Maya, the, kind of the next thing I want to talk about first, you know, to tell our audience what's happening now is we're, we're in what's kind of called bill signing season. Uh, Governor Kemp is given 40 days to either sign or veto a bill. And that deadline comes up on May the 7th. And usually it's, it's either May, you know, the last two days that we see all the vetoes, but from now until, until May 7th, we're going to have bill signing ceremonies. Um, we haven't had any ceremonies yet. We've had two bill signings, but no ceremonies. Our expectations, we're going to start seeing our first bill signings this week uh, at the end of the week. And, and, and then, you know, we head into the election cycle. We're going to have elections. And then, you know, we'll probably pick up our notes. A every bill, because the, for those who don't know, Georgia's legislature works on a two-year cycle. Every single bill is about to die. And we're going to start with House Bill 1. Senate Bill One uh, next year. We're going to start start from scratch. Um, I'd love to hear from Maya and Jonathan um, uh, on some of the bills. So any other bill you definitely want to mention from this session and what you're looking toward next year. And, and I'm going to start with this because I actually rolled out a story earlier this week about it. Is how we treat wrongfully convicted Georgians, people who were wrongfully convicted, exonerated, but they had spent years in jail. The, the two people I profiled. In the story that I rolled out earlier this week, had spent 22 and 25 years in prison. And, and for those who don't know, in the state of Georgia, that's treated like a piece of legislation. It's not a, a review panel or anything. It's just another bill. And we both know, all of us here know, any bill can get caught up in politics. And, and that's what happened with these two guys. And you can read more about that legislation. But for example, that's something I want to be watching for next year because it failed this year. Maya, talk about another bill from this session that you cared about if you want to look ahead to the next session. Um, another bill, and it's funny because it involves kind of the same senator that did pass and we're waiting, it passed early in session, and we're waiting to see uh, if the governor will sign it, is one that changes um, the bail bond <laughs> process. It added, oh gosh, I can't remember, I think more than two dozen uh, laws, many yes. uh, or char uh, offenses, many of them misdemeanors to the uh, list of <clears throat> list of bills. I mean, list of charges that judges must set some type of cash bail for. And people who support this say it's like to stop the, re the revolving door of people who are, you know, getting arrested, going through the booking process, being, you know, let out on. Um, uh, signature bond and then you know within a day or two are back in jail for a similar offense um and the people who oppose this say that a lot of the offenses that were added um target uh people who are unhoused and if you're unhoused most likely you can't pay a cash bond 
It also limits the ability for bail funds, which I think is something that kind of went a little unnoticed. Um, Cause a lot of times, you know, like for Mother's Day coming up, there are bail funds who they, they solicit donations and they bail mothers out of jail around Mother's Day. They do the same thing around Father's Day. They did this for the people who were charged um, with, uh, various crimes, including uh, uh, domestic terrorism for the people who were um, protesting at, you know, what we call Cop City. Um, and so that would, it, it feels as though that provision of the bill was very targeted to that. And I'm not sure if lawmakers thought about like the greater impact it may have. So uh, there's been a push uh, to convince um, the governor to veto, um, and the ACLU has already said that if he if he signs that, they are going to sue. So we'll see what happens. Jonathan? Well, I don't want to take too much time of our last few minutes with, with any of my predictions, which may not come true. My crystal ball hasn't been, it, it isn't the best, but I do think that we could all probably put some money, or lack of a better way of putting this, on some sort of sports betting Thank you, Raul, for laughing at my joke. Your check's in the mail for that. I do think that we will um, see see something like that. And what form, if any, um, you know, a bill addressing Medicaid expansion um, might be. That's one that we all talk about. That's one that was talked about a lot. Governor really wanted to keep his Pathways program out there. But, you know, I'm not a betting man, but I would put some money on sports betting. You know. That's my and last I... I would not bet on it passing next year. <laughs> I Probably I not actually, I, you know, I, I think, you know, we're going to have a little bit of turnover, not a ton, not obviously not um, what we dealt with two years ago when we basically had 50 plus new members, but we're going to have some turnover this time. Um, and probably not politically. I mean, politically, a seat here, a seat there. But I, I do want to see what the makeup the legislature looks like and, and what that could mean for, you know, a Medicaid expansion bill or for a gambling bill. So um, I, I I'm not saying I'm t uh, taking Jonathan's bet or Maya's bet, uh, but uh, definitely I, I think those are those are two things we're going to be watching for. And it's going to be interesting. You know, there are a handful of really interesting legislative races that that are going to be worth following both in may and in november and, and seeing what issues come up in those races um whether they are the bail bond restrictions or or whether they are um gambling or or other issues or school vouchers because like to see you know for the, the handful of folks who change their votes to see what happens happens in, in theirs uh in their races uh as we wrap up here uh love finishing uh, kind of final thoughts on the session what questions we get from people. So Nora, let's, let's, let's do a wrap up with you. Um, you know, you guys put in your work, you, you, you know, we're, we are watching some of, some of the bill signings and um, maybe what are you watching now? What are you watching for in the election? And, and if you want to, we can talk about January too. Oh, just all of it. Just fold it up in a nice bow. Uh, I, I got it. I'm watching SB 351, you know, regulating children's social media use. Uh, part of why I'm curious about whether the governor will sign or veto that bill is because Florida has a similar bill that became law and there are expected legal challenges already. And so when we're assessing the threats during the legislative session, what bills might move. I also think it's important to take a temperature of where we are nationally. And this is a trend that we are seeing in other states. And so I'm very curious if the governor will uh, actually sign that bill. I think that SB 63, which was mentioned already, um, is going to be incredibly important. Uh, contextually, part of that is because protest is such an essential way for people to leverage and use their voices. And during an election year, that is all the more important when people want to, um, when they feel either silenced or unheard, they'll come out and exercise that First Amendment right. And so I'll be curious how that bill moves. We, we are hopeful and working on pushing for the governor to veto SB 63 as well. Um, and as the year unfolds, 
you know, this is what's often being referred to as a year for democracy, you know, a year that globally is so crucial. Uh, billions of people will be voting. And in Georgia, uh, we know that Georgia is an epicenter for discussion, dialogue, um, and, and democracy. And so I'm really eager to continue the work that we do in advocating for people's First Amendment rights, for open record and open access to government. So thank you so much for having me, Rahul, and to the Atlanta Press Club. Um, I'll turn it to the other panelists. Maya, a uh, quick wrap on what you're watching from here to, to the end of the year. Um, uh, I am taking a big shift into these legislative primaries. You know, we are a little more than a month away from primaries and, you know, because of the way lines are drawn, like Raul said, um, we won't see a big shift in Democrat or Republican in these seats, but the primaries are where a majority of these races will be decided. Um, and so just keeping an eye on primaries across the state. There are several really interesting ones in the metro Atlanta area, as well as, you know, some long, there's some seats that are open that have recently become open after decades of being held. And so we have a ton of people who've signed up for primaries in those races. So it'll just be really interesting to see what, you know, obviously the, the chambers are losing a lot of institutional knowledge in these long time long so we'll see, you know, who comes in, if it's, you know, young, fresh faced politicians or if it's someone who maybe has served before. We see that happen a lot. Um, so, yeah, my, my main focus is going to be on elections through the end of the year, um, whether it's these primaries and then we get runoffs and then, um, then, then a long vacation in November. Jonathan? I'll be gearing up for November. I'll be reading what Maya is, is writing. And uh, she made a very good point. It seemed like just about every day we had uh, a, the announcement of a retirement. So seeing who will be coming in for next year, I think will tell us a lot about what we can expect. Uh, I'll leave you with just this thought. Um, Democrats in the House and Democrats in the Senate will have new leaders. Uh, and the Republican held third congressional will have a new member of Congress. Uh, it is going to be interesting to see the direction that Republicans and Democrats go with both that congressional seat out in West Georgia and with their leadership in the House and Senate. And it can be very telling of what the next two years are going to be like when we get back to the legislature in 272 days until the 2025 session. Uh, I'm Raul Ballard. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? <laughs> right. Can't help us now. Maya knows oh, I, I dropped those numbers and she'll just if you ever want entertainment y'all just watch uh, watch me it's uh, Maya sitting next to each other on the live stream on the state senate website um, but I'll leave it at that I'm Raul Ballard with WAB News and the Atlanta Press Club Jonathan, Nora, Maya thank you all so much Julia Boy thank you for organizing and thanks to our partners both at the Atlanta Press Club and at the Georgia First Amendment Foundation for helping put this on. Thanks to everybody who's joined us. Uh, I'm Raul Bally and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thanks so much.